what kind of self-talk do I have? Like, what am I manifesting here? And to really open up, because they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so really meditating on that, you know, going to the cushion, going to the altar and saying, I'm ready, or am I ready? Or what's getting in my way? Or asking for guidance. Or even just praying and asking for the teacher to appear, asking for guidance about where the teacher is and where the next, what's the next step, and following that intuitive lead. You know, asking for guidance and opening and meditating on opening and looking at, you know, what what is what if anything is getting in the way. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savannah Podcast. As always, we've got a really great guest in store for you today. Before we dive in, I want to remind you to head on over to savannahspirit.com forward slash contest to enter each and every week for the chance to win an $100 gift card for the Savannah Spirit Store. We have an incredible guest today who, I just have a feeling this podcast is going to be chock full of amazing tips for you guys on how to power your yoga practice and take it to the next level. We're speaking to Brian Leaf. He's the author of 13 books, including The Teacher Appears and The Misadventures of a Garden State Yogi. He graduated from Georgetown in 1993. He has degrees in business, English, and theology, and he has a master's degree specializing in yoga and Ayurveda. And he's speaking with us today from Northampton, Massachusetts. Brian, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's good to be here. So the question I wanted to ask you to kick off, and of course, I'm super excited to learn more about you, but there's this quote, and I saw it on your website, and I know it's part of your book, and I am sure listeners have heard this quote as well. And the quote is, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I was hoping you could tell us where this quote comes from, what it means, and maybe then you could tell us about your first teacher and how it, this quote applies to you. Gosh, there's a, there's a lot there. You know, I'm not sure where the quote comes from. I think that it is sometimes attributed to Buddha, and that's not true. I think that's one of those things where, you know, there's these famous quotes from George Washington or whatever, but he didn't really say them. I think it's not really from the Buddha, but people, I think, attribute it sometimes to the Buddha. And I myself don't know where it comes from. I chose it for the book because, uh, as the title of the book, the book is called The Teacher Appears. And uh, I like I like titles that are part of sayings that kind of elicit uh, the, the reader to finish the saying or make, you know, sort of allude to something. I also like it because the quote is relevant to the to this book that I've put out, The Teacher Appears, in two ways. One, within the book, The Teacher Appears, so it's 108 prompts to power your yoga practice. It's like inspiring quotes and activities and kind of jumps off the page, you know, brings you in to do things from coloring in, you know, Ganesh to uh, doing postures. But within the book, I asked about 30 or so famous yoga teachers, uh, mentors, people I, friends or people who inspire me, I reached out to, you know, Sharon Gannon and Shiva Ray and Sean Korn and different people. And uh, I asked them to to contribute a, a quote or a prompt or an activity in the book. And so one of the reasons it's called The Teacher Appears is because you buy this book and then you're flipping through it and all of a sudden there's Sean Korn and The Teacher Appears, you know. But it's also called that because ultimately the aim of the book, and I think the aim of yoga, is to tune into our own you know, our own Atman, to tune into our own connection to, to divinity and to truth and uh, to, to prana. And to the book aims at bringing people in touch with their inner wisdom, with their true self, with their, their own godness, you know, and that's the teacher appearing as well. So that's why it's called that. Okay, yeah, my first teacher. So I would answer that with two parts. One is that back in 1989, I graduated high school and I went off to college at Georgetown University uh, in D.C. And uh, my brother had taken, he went to a large university, University of Virginia, and had taken all these wacky courses. And he was my big brother and I looked up to him and I wanted to emulate him and imitate him. So I he, he took like, I don't know, frisbee and karate and um, riflery and all these things, you know, as electives. And so I was flipping through the book in, in the Georgetown catalog. Back then it was an actual physical book. And uh, I was just looking for the weirdest thing I could find um, just because he had done that. And Georgetown's a smaller school. They don't have as many electives. And the weirdest thing I could find was this thing called yoga. So I signed up for it. 
I showed up on day one, and this was 1989, so there weren't a lot of guys doing yoga then, I guess, not as much as now. So first of all, I was standing outside this room in the gymnasium at, George, at Georgetown, and there was about like 25 women and me, and uh, I had no idea what yoga was. And all of a sudden, this dude shows up, huge beard, uh, all white clothes, leather sandals. And you know, now everybody has leather sandals, but back then it was kind of a specialty item. <laughs> And, uh, and he came in and uh, started teaching and I was, I was just sold day one. I just loved it. It was like, you know, it was like falling in love. It was like meeting your soulmate or like one of those, you know, I think we all have experiences, maybe some of the listeners with yoga or other things where you just day one, you know, it's not even like you love it. It's just, you know, you found your home. It's like you've been an alien all this time and you found where you belong. And uh, even on day one, I just, you know, just immediately loved it. So he was my first teacher. But then really also my first teacher was many years later, I was trying different styles of yoga and I stumbled upon Kripalu yoga and uh, in Hoboken, New Jersey, I would say in a way, Yolantha Smith, who was that teacher, she was also my first teacher because uh, Kripalu then became my like deeper yoga home after traveling through different kinds of yogas over the years. I, I love your description of falling in love with yoga because I can definitely relate to that. And coming back to that quote, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I think I get so provoked and I'm so curious about it because, of course, it's about the teacher within. And I think we can all relate to that. And I love, I love that the book is about that. I want you to tell us more. At the same time, I think studying back, and I know you have a huge degrees in um, theology, so I'm hoping you can share with us, but from what I know and have learned, it seems that in the ancient yoga, that yoga really, really was passed down from one teacher to one student, or even the Mysore style of yoga, right? People were practicing in a group, but each person was sort of getting a mini private from one teacher. And it seems so different from the model that we have now where yoga is kind of a group fitness class where everyone's sort of just being expected to do the same thing or move through the same postures or the same sequence at the same pace. In your studies, have you found out more about this or what the original role of that teacher was was really meant to be? That's a good question. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I actually haven't gone very, very far in academic pursuits you know, of yoga. And I know, I know what you mean. And there are a lot of folks who've done that. And it's interesting because I, I didn't do it in a way on purpose. Um, so, so when I was at Georgetown, uh, I immediately got really into yoga and it just really took over. And I, you know, I started doing it physical practices and I started studying it in every way I could. And Georgetown's a great place for that because it's a Jesuit school. You know, it's great for any kind of religious or spiritual pursuits and, and you know, education. And so I, uh, I found the Hinduism expert on, on campus, and I started taking classes with him. And uh, he was a Jesuit who had lived in India for 10 years and done his, I don't know, seminary or, or residency, or I forget what it's called, but had done that there. And uh, But what happened was, I actually, it was interesting, I had this sort of like divide where I was learning too much about the esoteric practices while still being this totally neurotic, OCD, fully anxious Jewish guy from New Jersey. <laughs> and I like, you know, I was like, so it was, it was weird. It didn't work. It was like, really what I needed was like American yoga to just like breathe and relax and chill. But I was also reading about Nirvana and the theories on this. And, and so I actually pulled back from the, I didn't want, you know, my my brain had been so finely tuned as a tool, you know, in high school and, and being an overachiever and a perfectionist in academia that I realized my yoga practice wasn't going to be about the brain, but it was going to be about, you know, like many of us, re-embracing and re-entering the body and re-entering and re-embracing my energy field and re entering and re-embracing my spirit and my intuition, my connection to prana, following my gut, you know, reading the energy um, as far as what food do I need? What what does my body need right now? What is my intuitive guide, you know, my prana? Where, where is energy leading me? I had really become pretty distanced from all that. And I realized that, you know, I didn't actually want a heady pursuit. So I actually put off um, learning, kind of diving deep into the esoteric and the and the, the yana yoga, you know, the study of the books and the, the scriptures. So I did very deeply for a bit, and then I totally pulled back. And in fact, so the answer is I'm not totally sure. There are a few people who are real yoga scholars and could really go into that. I don't know. But, but to go to the other part of your question in the book, part of the aim of the book is exactly what I just talked about, you know, is to bring people kind of 
back in touch with their inner guide, their inner experience. It's not even so touchy-feely. It's really just, you know, we all have these this inner knowing. Um, I mean, it's as simple as like, how do we know that today we need some avocado in our salad <laughs> and that's going to be just right for us? Or how do we know that, you know, you can really tune into these things and, and they can get really deep. And so really the goal of the book, as you mentioned, is not so much to pursue the aerobics class of yoga, which is fine, um, but to go deeper and, and really kind of tune in into a devotion, tune into our heart, um, to tune into our true self, our connection to spirit, um, and to really make yoga rich and deep in that way. Yeah. Having looked at your book, I just encourage and, and let the listeners know and correct me if this is wrong, but it's, it's more like a workbook. Like it's, it's not so much like a book you just read alone in bed. It's very interactive, really prompting you to, as you said, color and write things down. And tell me a little bit how, how that came about uh, as sort of the idea or the crux for the book. Exactly. That's, that's right. And, and, um, it's kind of like I was just saying, I guess, because I started it originally as, so I've written all these other books and some of them are memoirs and some of them are how to's. And it started out kind of as a, you know, self help kind of book with these actionable items and, and a bit of a narrative. And, and then I realized like, wow, to really do this thing I'm aiming for, wouldn't it be cool? And if instead of describing to people what I'm trying to say, I could just bring them into the experience of it like a yoga class itself. So the book is almost kind of designed as a class. It begins with an ohm and ends with a shavasana, um, although it's not intended necessarily for somebody to go through the 108 prompts in order, you know, you just flip around. But but yeah, so the idea is to bring people into an experience of things, to foster an experience. And it was inspired, actually, there's a great book, uh, totally un, unrelated to yoga, but or at least directly, but it's, uh, it's called um, Wreck This Journal. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a really funny book. And it's a creativity book. It's a book you'd find in like a craft store. And it has all these wacky things. My son opened it up one day and he opened up to this page that said, tear out this page and hide it in your neighbor's shrubs. <laughs> it's just so funny. And, you know, it just really broke the fourth wall and was whoever tells you to tear out a page of a book. And I thought, wow, I want to do that with my yoga book. I want to just, you know, tear down the boundaries and just, just open it up and get people to engage the book. I also liked it because it's a book that really benefits from being in paper. And I like the idea of people holding the book and engaging with it and tucking it in their yoga bag and carrying it around. And just, you know, you need some inspiration, you flip it open uh, and just find something there. You know, like here's a page I just opened to just for today. No complaining about anything. Be only gratitude. Keep this book with you so you'll remember. And just, you know, just little challenges, little prompts, all based basically on I don't know, teachers I've come upon over the years or classes I've taken or things people inspired me to do. Some of the work at Kripalu. I love it. I I love combining yoga and journaling. And I do freeform journaling and I have, you know, tons of ways that I journal that I also try to share with people. But I think what's so lovely about this is for people who are maybe really new to putting thoughts on the page or getting started with writing, because it's something we often stop doing as we get older as adults. It gives them a really concrete and easy place to start, which leads me to ask you what your personal practice looks like these days. I'm curious if you incorporate writing or you were always sort of reading inspirational quotes before you did your personal practice and this is how the book evolved. Can, can you tell us about what your either yoga or mindfulness practice looks like on a daily basis, just living your, living your life? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So base, well, let me see, I guess from the beginning, first of all, I started out back in 89 in Georgetown really being a physical yogi. You know, I did, I did the postures and that was incredible for me and that's uh, it healed certain illnesses I had and it just, you know, got my body kind of going again. I think I was a little stagnant and it got things moving and taught me how to be in my body. And that led to the next step, which was once I was more aware of my body, I became more aware of my diet. I started eating better, um, just tapping into, again, my intuitive guide. You know, what, what does my body feel like it needs today? Um, which I think is way better than any set of rules um, is to come from inside and say, what do I need? And then um, let's see. And then fast forward a bunch of years later, and ironically, about five years ago, I was writing my yoga memoir, Misadventures of a Garden State Yogi, which was about healing through various illnesses and, and using yoga and being touched by yoga. And uh, I also had little kids. So I had little kids. I was spending all of a sudden, all day I was spending on my computer writing. I was stressed out. I had deadlines. 
I had these little kids and I had, you know, my time was not my own and I was super busy. And I basically stopped doing postures. I was still uh, meditating at that point. Uh, over, I forgot to say over time, meditation became more the focus even, which is kind of an organic practice in yoga. Really, the postures, theoretically, the postures really lead us to meditate. They're, they're there to open the channels and allow a better meditation. So over time, I started meditating more. And when I was writing this book, I, uh, I stopped doing postures. I was just too busy. And I was writing about yoga all day and sitting in my chair and stressed out. And I got actually, my back started hurting. And I was like, suddenly this 40-year-old dude with a, with a bad back, <laughs> not doing yoga. And so that got me back into it. So I started doing yoga again. I got better, which was awesome. Started writing a book about that. And so now, my practice now is, I would say I do postures about hopefully four or five times a week for 15, 20 minutes. I do a nice long shavasana at the end. And I try to sit uh, once or ideally even twice a day. And that would be, that's my practice now. And my sitting practice, my meditation is like a, you know, like a mindfulness practice of Vipassana. One of the things you talk about in your memoir that you say yoga healed, and I think you mean Ayurvedic medicine and all sorts of things as well, which I'm hoping you'll tell us about, but is both colitis and ADD, which I think so many people can relate to and, and, and struggle with. Tell us more about that. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how it all started was um, when I was in high school before, you know, before I went to Georgetown, before yoga, I came down with ulcerative colitis, which is it's like an ulcer, but in the colon. And it's rough. <laughs> it's no good. Um, I was really sick. I lost a ton of weight. I had really low energy. And I was really stressed out kid. I was stressed. Um, I was actually the number one debater in New Jersey. And, you know, New Jersey folks, I, I think... Uh, can you know they they know how to argue so <laughs> I was pretty pretty good but so I I was very stressed out and I didn't have tools I didn't really know how to eat I didn't know how to stretch I didn't know how to relieve you know how to release uh, stress and strain um, also I would say even bigger I didn't really know how to feel or express my feelings um, and so it all I guess manifested basically in ulcerative colitis and then I went off to Georgetown. So before that, in that process, you know, my family, we went to different doctors and I got the right doctor and I got, you know, prescribed the right medicine and I, and I got better. And they told me that colitis has often a period of repeat. And I went off to Georgetown and sure enough, and I got really into yoga. And then a couple of years later, the colitis came back and uh, I went back to Jersey to see my doctor and get the tests and I went on meds and it wasn't getting better actually this time. And they were talking about possibly surgery and it was really scary. And then one day I realized, and this was a huge leap for me at the time. I mean, now 25 years later and with what we know and what's popular now, it doesn't it might not seem that much of a leap, but at the time it was a total leap for me. I suddenly realized, whoa, the days when I go to yoga class, I feel a little better. So maybe I should just do a whole lot of that yoga. And so I literally started doing yoga five five times a day, uh, sun salutations in particular, and then a nice long shavasana. And uh, truly, uh, after three days, the symptoms were gone, and which is kind of incredible. And, uh, and that was it. I was better. And over time, I, I learned to express my feelings more and, and feel my feelings and relieve stress and strain. And I stretched and my, you know, my, I mean, basically doing yoga will increase the machine of the body. It makes the body work better. You know, you just process things better and relieve toxins better. And it just makes the, this machine that is the body work better. Um, the energy flows more, the blood flows more. And so I just got healthier and, and, you know, through all these and eating better and all that. Um, and then the colitis came back two years later. So it looked like two years was my repeat. And, uh, this time, as soon as I caught it, I didn't even, you know, I didn't even do anything else. As soon as I noticed the very first symptom, I just upped my yoga practice and, and it worked. Even now, 25 years later, it's like, oh, I don't know, it's almost hard for me to believe. Even now, but it, re it, was, it was amazing. So a few days later, I upped the yoga practice five times a day, and it got better. And, you know, but and it, I didn't just stop there. I mean, I continued to get healthier, and I continued to learn to use and treat my body better um, and my emotions and stress and eating. And uh, so that was that. And then 10 years later... Um, I had been moving around. I graduated college and I was, I would move around every year. I was studying yoga. I was tutoring. I was teaching, doing different things, being in relationships. And, uh, I kind of just considered myself a free spirit. But then one day I was in a therapy session with this therapist and she said, you know, I think you need to consider the fact that you never commit to anything. Uh, Cause you know, I'd moved like every year for 10 years and I thought I was just being free. And she said, you know, I think you need to consider the fact that you have ADHD, which was a very popular diagnosis then. But, um, and she said, you know, you are not ADHD really in my case, more ADD. So not hyper. 
But uh, she said, you know, I think you need to consider that it's actually hard for you to stick with something because of the way your brain is wired. And I was kind of devastated, you know. Um, I was like, oh, man, maybe I'm never going to be able to settle down and get married and have kids and stick with a job and, and have a life in that way. And then I remembered, hey, remember when I was diagnosed with colitis and yoga and Ayurveda offered me some insight to heal it, not just accept the disease, you know, sort of stagnant Western kind of static, this is the way you're wired way, but in a dynamic, your you know, your body is a hologram of your consciousness kind of way of, hey, I can do things to rebalance this, you know. Um, like Ayurveda doesn't just say, this is the way you are, deal with it. Ayurveda says, there's an imbalance. Let's see if we can balance it. So I said, maybe I can see ADD as an imbalance and I can balance it. So I started doing research and studying. And finally, in Ayurveda, I found this something that said uh, ADD is like an imbalance of the vata dosha. So I went full tilt, just like I had with the yoga into Ayurveda to try to see if I could balance the vata. And I, and I would say it worked. Over time, um, I showed up with less ADD and I was able to you know, hold down a job and stick with things and be more focused and have kids and get married. And, and I, would, I would say that Ayurveda really helped me. ADD is still in my proclivity. It's still, the possibility is still there, but using Ayurveda to balance my doshas, to balance my constitution, I'm able to experience that, um, you know, that ADD as much more balanced and much less extreme. And, and tell our listeners what that Ayurvedic practice looked like, because I think there's often so much misconception and misunderstanding around what Ayurveda really is. So were you doing specific yoga practices that were designed to balance the doshas, or were you actually doing a specific diet and eating very specific things based on what an Ayurvedic practitioner had suggested for you? Well, so that's the beauty of Ayurveda, right? And for anybody who doesn't know, for any listeners, Ayurveda is sometimes called the sister science of yoga. And uh, it's the medical side, really. And in India, even now, there's Ayurvedic hospitals and then sort of like Western allopathic hospitals. And so uh, Ayurveda is the traditional medical system of India, thousands of years, you know, of, of development and observation and, and channeling and wisdom. So Ayurveda is not so much one modality like, you know, homeopathics are or Bach flower essences or herbs, but it's it's a framework to see uh, the body, to see health, to see disease. And um, as such, it could use anything, right? So I did, I saw a bunch of different practitioners. I even did a year long training course just to learn and so I could learn how to heal myself. And um, I guess my primary modalities were, um, so, so Vata Dosha, there's in Ayurveda, there's um, there's vata dosha, which is like air and ether. It's somebody who's, you know, in, in the West, we'd say somebody who's spacey, maybe or ungrounded or um, ADD kind of kind of way. Um, then there's the fiery dosha, the pitta, which is somebody who's really intense. And you know, of course, all of us are a mix of these. It's just sometimes one of them in particular is out of balance. And then kapha is earth and water, and that's somebody who's like really mellow. And out of balance, that would be somebody who's like too stuck. So those are the three. So for me, it was vata dosha. It was, I was too airy, too spacey, too ungrounded in the clouds kind of thing. And so the, the balancing for that, the therapies are anything that balances that, that counterbalances it. So I ate a more grounding diet. I avoided for, for a while in the therapeutic phase, in the healing phase, I actually avoided like raw food. I avoided um, cold food. So I ate foods cooked with some spice and some oil. Whenever I was in a relationship, you know, my girlfriends would always get very frustrated with me because that was back in the day, about 20 years ago, when oil was kind of like the, the enemy, <laughs> you know, fat and oil. And I was always cooking with like tons of oil and, and fat in my diet. Little did they know you were ahead of the curve. <laughs> right. Now we've rediscovered oil is not so bad. It might be sugar. That's the enemy. But but anyway, so uh, so food wise, I was eating cooked food with some spice and lots of grounding oil, you know, exercise, doing more gentle type stuff, uh, trying to sleep more, getting lots of sunshine, taking certain herbs that were good for grounding and relaxing. Uh, it applies to anything. If you get a massage, you probably wouldn't go deep tissue. You'd go more like soothing with oil, yoga practice, again, more gentle styles, um, diet, a big one. Because, you know, that again, that was a time where nowadays... A lot of yogis you're going to find in the West, at least, are going to be eating a lot of like organic meat, right? Whereas 20 years ago, if you were a yogi, you know, you were probably a vegetarian. So I was probably basically a raw um, vegetarian at that time and realized like, whoa, this is making me super ungrounded. So I took in a little bit of meat and uh, more oil. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, structure. It's really super grounding and helpful for a Vata person to... Uh, 
to have a structure to their day, a structure to their week. And again, I didn't have, have that at all. I was just this sort of free spirit wandering around nomad guy. And so I took on a structure and bought a date book and more predictability to my week. Um, and then also keeping warm is really big for Vata, as opposed to being cold or chilly. There's just a, a million of these different lifestyle recommendations. And when you put them all together, they, they really help. And especially over time, there's a rebalancing, a fundamental rebalancing. For listeners who are really curious and want to go deeper into Ayurveda, there's a podcast I did just a few weeks ago with Sahara Rose where we go really deep into all of this. So I'd encourage them to, I'd encourage you to listen to it for more info because it really is powerful. And I think what you're sharing with us, Brian, is so important because I think for a lot of people, depending on where they live and what their lifestyle is, they they may have this hope or this fantasy that yoga and maybe Ayurveda could help them overcome something like colitis or ADD, but they don't really know anyone who's actually been able to achieve that. So through sharing these stories, I think it's really inspirational and, and it's important for us to, as yogis, to share this info with each other that really you can make profound, profound changes and progress even to disease like colitis just through yoga and Ayurveda and really focusing on your lifestyle and sort of stepping into the role of being your own teacher because I think kind of coming back to our theme that's what this is really about instead of just saying oh I have colitis help me prescribe me something I mean you really stepped into the role of the manager and leader of this disease and and as you shared like even going to Ayurvedic school yourself to figure it out I I think that's amazing. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it ties back to what we were talking about before, too, because, you know, I was talking about how The Teacher Appears, the book, is about bringing people in touch with their, you know, it's like, it's like all of Ayurveda is inside of us. And if we were fully in balance, we would organically simply know which foods to eat, what types of yoga to do, which kinds of massage are best for us, what kind of meditation is best for us, what sort of exercise and sleep habits and all these things, you know, how often to have sex, like, I don't know, just all things would intuitively flow right out of us if we were fully in balance. But because we're not, sometimes we need a leg up, we need a hint that will start us into balance so that we can then feel it ourselves. And the goal of the book, The Teacher Appears, is to to facilitate people to feel it themselves. And I would say Ayurveda as well helped to facilitate it. You know, before I was ready to feel myself what kind of food is best for me and what sort of sleep habits are best and what kind of yoga is best and herbs, Ayurveda told me and that got me going. So I I think it really helps in, in the whole process. I know. I love that idea of it being like this info that's locked inside us that we just need to need to reaccess. Before we let you go, I want to ask you a little bit about one of your other books, which is actually about parenting. And I'm sure many of our listeners are parents. I myself am pregnant right now with my first child. So there was no way I was going to let you go without sharing just a little bit about how you ended up using this concept of kind of trusting your own inner wisdom, being your own best teacher, and applying that to the, the landscape of parenting, which is, is very overwhelming. And there's so many opinions. And if you have a couple key takeaways you'd want to share with us, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so that book is called Misadventures of a Parenting Yogi, and uh, it's, a, it's about conscious parenting. It's about, you know, what is it to be uh, a yogi and to be a mindfulness practitioner and be a parent? And um, gosh, yeah, what are the take-homes? I really, a couple of things. So, so for specific than general, I really love the work of um, Simplicity Parenting, which is Kim John Payne. He wrote a book and he has this movement and it's really cool. It's just, uh, oh, the, one of the parts about that that I love the most, and, and you're a couple of years away from this, but is um, not, I think kids in our culture too early, too much get like adult concerns, you know, they watch the news and see people get shot and hear about money worries. And uh, there's this concept in this book of, of protecting a child for the first few years or even the first 10 years from these very mature adult anxieties. And I love that. You know, my wife and I tried really hard to, it's not like a controlling or obsessive thing. It's just like, hey, you know, we're not going to have the news on during dinner. Uh, we're not going to talk about our money worries at the dinner table. You know, the kids don't need to develop that sense of anxiety. It's better to have this real safe cocoon for them. Um, I also loved the work of Elfie Cohen, who does um, 
uh, what's this book called? I think Unconditional Parenting was the one. And it's just this notion of being mindful with your kids, really looking at, you know, when they're acting out, instead of just punishing them, saying, what's happening for them? What do they need? Is their cup not full? Do they need, are they feeling insecure or unloved? You know, just what do they need? And then lastly, in a wider sense, what I would consider, you know, of, of conscious parenting is, yeah, just to parent from our heart. I mean, parenting is super hard. Being alive is really hard. It's hard to be a human being, right? I mean, the, the Buddha's noble truth, life is suffering. The path to, to get into not suffering is to acknowledge that life is suffering and to meditate. And so just to realize like life is challenging. It's hard to be alive and it's even harder, I think, to be a parent and to see your kids suffer, to know that this is a difficult plane in a way. I mean, it's also wonderful and blissful and glory filled, but it's not perfect. And uh, to just allow, I think, ourselves and our children to be imperfect in the process and to parent from our heart. I don't know, a lot of generalities there, but that was, those would be my tips to you. Mm, thank you. That's so great. And you've mentioned Buddha and Buddhism a couple times that have come up in our conversation. I'm just curious, is that out of all the sort of yoga lineage, the one that, that you're the most connected to at, at this point? That's a good question. I guess you could say that, right? Because because my primary practice really at this point is is my sitting practice, is my meditation. And the yoga postures really I use um, to keep my body feeling good and feeling able to sit and allowing my sitting practice to be deeper. So, I mean, the sitting, uh, it's a good question. I, I certainly don't consider myself Buddhist, um, but yeah, I guess it does inform, it does inform my, my spiritual life quite a lot. My teacher is Swami Kripalu, the namesake of the Kripalu Yoga Center. I consider him my, my guide and, and sort of mentor and guru. He's not alive, but, um, but, but yeah, I would say, I would say um, his work and, and certainly Buddhism do inform my practice a very, a very lot. And last question for those out there who maybe feel like they just haven't found the teacher, the yoga teacher, or the meditation teacher who's the right one for them, or they haven't felt that connection yet. Maybe they're struggling at home. Obviously, they can get your book, but do you have any words of wisdom or just encouragement you want to share? Because I think a lot of yogis, you know, you, they are people experimenting with these practices. They just end up going to whatever studio is close to their house and they don't necessarily find. And I think, you know, you mentioned someone by name and I think I too, you know, I can mention maybe two or three people who are just pivotal in teaching me. <laughs> and I think, I guess we just have to trust that those people are going to appear and show up when we're ready, coming coming back to our initial quote. But do, do you have any just advice for listeners who maybe feel like they want to go deeper with all of this, but they just haven't met that teacher yet? Who's going to be the catalyst for them? Definitely. I, guess, I think I have a lot to say about that, but I'll try to make it brief. So first of all, um, I think of finding a teacher or finding a yoga style very much really like dating, actually. It's like, you know, you just date all these people and you experience all these people and experience the connections before you before one finds perhaps, you know, the one that they're going to settle down with or become married with or whatever. And I think yoga is the same. I think it's important to just really date and try out all these different styles, try different studios, try different styles of yoga. Uh, I went on this cross-country trip with a friend of mine to try out as many styles as I could to see what was the right one for for me, not everybody has to do that, but but you know, just really being open and, and exploring the different options and staying open and uh, paying attention and seeing which one, when you know, when do you fall in love and which style is it. So that's one thing. So so stay curious is probably number one. Like keep keep dating. <laughs> Yes, definitely. And then on a more, exactly, and then on a more uh, metaphysical kind of level to really examine, and, and this is probably true in dating as well, to examine what kind of self-talk do I have? Like, what am I manifesting here? And to really open up, because they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so really meditating on that, you know, going to the cushion, going to the altar and saying, I'm ready, or am I ready? Or what's getting in my way? Or asking for guidance. Or even just praying and asking for the teacher to appear, um, asking for guidance about where the teacher is and where the next, what's the next step, and following that intuitive lead. You know, asking for guidance and opening and meditating on opening um, and looking at, you know, what what is what if anything is getting in the way. I, I had a friend uh, years and years ago who realized that she was ready for a partner, and she realized that she was sleeping in a big, you know, queen bed, but only had one pillow. <laughs> so she said, I'm going to go out and buy another pillow, because if I'm ready for my partner to show up, I need a pillow for that partner, you know? So it's like that, but metaphorically, just are we really 
setting the stage to be ready. Are we ready? Are we? Do we have mental beliefs that we need to examine that are getting in the way, doubts or, or fears, and just, just being present with those, you know, not... No, not beating oneself up, but just being really mindful and open and honest. What's what's the status? Mm, I think those are great tips. Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And for people who want to learn more about you, I know you also teach some live day-long workshops. I think I saw mainly on the East Coast, but what's the best way for people to stay in touch and find you? Yeah, I'd love to hear from anybody. Um, so my website is teacherappears.net. Uh, teacher like T-E-A-C-H-R and appears. Uh, the book is The Teacher Appears, 108 Prompts to Power Your Yoga Practice. And people can reach me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And uh, I'd love to hear from folks. Wonderful. Thanks so much and namaste. Namaste. Great to talk to you. Hi, everyone. Brett here with an announcement. We are starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter the contest to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com forward slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, would really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes and left us a review. Leave us some comments. We love your feedback and share this podcast with anyone who you think might also enjoy it. I also wanted to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of our Facebook group where you can ask questions, see who's coming on the show and share your ideas. We will post the most recent episodes there, as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and topics on the shows. Again, thank you so, so much for listening. And from my heart to yours, namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.